Well, we are in week five of our Summer Stories series, and it's been incredible over the last few weeks, uh, the way that the Lord has moved and the way that the Spirit has been speaking. And this morning, we're going to take a deep dive into another parable that Jesus told, and uh, I'm excited to share this one with you today. Uh, It's a powerful revelation of the kingdom of God, and as we've been talking about in this series, that's really what the parables are all about, is that Jesus is revealing to us aspects of the kingdom of God. And he uses story to convey these things because there's a real special message, a real specialness to these parables. What Jesus is communicating, he's doing so in a very special way because I believe the contents of what he's communicating is so rich, it's so valuable, that he didn't just deliver it in any ordinary way. No, he he packaged it special because there are special contents that he wanted to share with his disciples. Then, I believe there's some special revelation that God wants to share with us as his disciples here today. And so if you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, really believe the Lord wants to move mightily in this message today, and I'm I'm just filled with faith. I hope you are as well as we unpack the word. And so here's what he says beginning in verse 1 of Matthew 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. It was too late. It was too late. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, it says, because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, the point of this text is normally eschatological in nature, meaning that it speaks of the end of all things, which is true. In fact, much of the parables point to Jesus' return, to the rapture of the church, the judgment of the wicked, the rewarding of the saints. And so the parables are rich in eschatological truth, in things that point to the return of Jesus, the point to the end of all things. But the word the Lord has for us today is is just a little deeper than that. Is it all right if we go a little deeper today? I I believe that the Lord has some fresh manna for this house. I believe that the Lord has an on-time word for us here in this place. And so we can build our theology or we can build our relationship with Jesus. We can build our doctrine or we can build our trust and reliance upon God. Listen, there's a lot of people whose heads are filled with all kinds of philosophy and all kinds of concepts, and they can teach a class, but when it comes time for them to put feet to their faith, can I tell you that a lot of times they just stand idle. You can be educated beyond your level of obedience. There's a great danger in that, friends, that if we only fill our heads but we never say yes to the little baby step that God is calling us to take, then we're not actually growing, we're self-deceived. Maturity in the spirit is not tied to age. Maturity in the spirit is not tied to intelligence. Maturity in the spirit, hear me, is tied to obedience. That's where you grow when you give God your yes. And it doesn't matter what it is, Okay, And you might think of it as a big yes, a small yes. All of it helps you grow when you say yes to what the Lord has called you to do. You see, it seems to me that all believers do well at trusting Jesus with their future. But only some believers do well at trusting him with their present day. Come on. How how come it is that we can trust Jesus with our eternal security? We can trust him with our eternal destination where we're going to spend forever and ever, but we can't trust him for how we're going to pay the water bill next week. 
We can trust him that he's worked all things out, that everything, he, he will execute perfect justice, righteous justice on the wicked, and he'll make all things right, that he will dry every tear from every eye, that he will do away with sickness and death and disease and sin and all of these things, but we can't trust him, come on, to give us peace to sleep at night. You see, we struggle in the day-to-day, but I believe it takes a believing believer to allow the Lord to come into your circumstance and move on your behalf in a way that, that really shows where your faith is at. Because our faith is more than simply a confession. Our faith is more than simply a doctrine. Our faith is tied to our relationship with Jesus. And do we trust him or don't we trust him? And that's the bottom line. Will we obey him or will we not obey him? He wants us to trust him with our current life, not just in the life to come. And so every, every churchgoer has got a lamp to show off, a light to shine, a gift to be used for the glory of God. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. We've got those things, and God wants us to use them. But hear me, not every churchgoer has got fresh oil in their lamp. They may have a gift, but it doesn't mean that they have an anointing. There's a lot of gifted churches, a lot of gifted people, but it doesn't mean that they have an anointing. They might go through the religious motions, but it doesn't mean they have an active relationship with the Messiah. They may claim to know the bridegroom, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the bridegroom knows them. And on the day that the bridegroom returns, it won't matter your gift, your position in the church, or what your name is. Hello. Here Jesus is speaking to believers Turn to your neighbor and tell him, he's talking to you. Jesus is talking to us. If you're a believer in this house today, because here's what we can do. We have a tendency to take scriptures like this one, stories like this one, and apply them to somebody else. We have a tendency to apply them to an unbelieving world, to apply them to somebody that Jesus wasn't even talking to at the moment. He's talking to believers, and if there's a believer in this room, then he's talking to you. So here Jesus is speaking to believers. He's stressing the importance of just one thing in terms of being ready for his coming, and that's that they would have fresh oil in their lamps, that they would have fresh oil in their lamps. And in verses 8 and 9, he said something that you better not miss if you want to be ready, and so I want to repeat it here, verses 8 and 9. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Turn to your other neighbor now and tell him, you better get your own oil. Oh, come on, Maddie. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you better get your own oil. Find a neighbor, somebody. Look, you better get your own oil. Come on, if you don't tell them, they're going to come after you trying to, trying to get some of your oil. And it doesn't work that way. And Jesus wants us to understand that. You better get your own oil. That's a phrase, as soon as I utter it, you've got context for it. You, you understand what, what oil is about. You know, that's what I want to talk to you about for the next few moments is about the price of oil. Come on, that's, that's big headlines. The price of oil is in our minds. It's in the news. It, it, we're constantly seeing the signs for the, the prices for these things. And I recently saw a meme circulating on social media. It had a, a close-up of this uh, little lit up gas pump on a car's dashboard. Anybody else see this meme? Couple of you, okay. So uh, it said, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And, and why was it so funny? Because it's true, right? Like we used to you know, go fill up when we got below half a tank. And so there's a bunch of us now that we're like, I'm just gonna keep cruising on you know, with that light, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna keep on going. We're not filling up today. We're gonna fill up another day. And so you know, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And so we have context for that in our culture today. When we see it, 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 it hits us you know, some kind of way because it's relevant, because we can relate to it. And so what we don't have a context for when we read the parables oftentimes is what was happening in the the ancient Jewish culture. And so what we can do is we can take a parable, lift it up out of its cultural context, and we can misunderstand or misapply the truth that's contained in it. Are you with me? And so we need to understand, we need to be rooted in the context of the culture. And so in ancient Jewish culture, there were actually three distinct steps to the wedding, because that's what we're talking about here, right? The wedding. 
And so the first one I want to share with you is called Shadukin. It's a, a time of mutual commitment. And so what would happen here is that often the father of the groom would select a bride for his son, or sometimes a matchmaker might be used called a Shadkan. And this matchmaker wasn't like Tinder or some other online dating service. It was actually considered a holy vocation to arrange a good marital match. And so consent was required, uh, contrary to some people's beliefs. It wasn't forced. But consent was required, but romantic love wasn't necessary for marriage. Instead, common belief was that romantic love would simply develop over time. That's contrary to our current culture, isn't it? That's tough for us to relate to. And like I said, we don't really have, have a, a culture a context for that in our culture, but most of the time in our culture, feelings are what bring us together, and feelings are what drive us apart. We make it all about feelings. And so we romanticize marriage, we romanticize the relationships, and, and we center the feelings in the middle of that. And what happens is when sometimes when the feelings change, so too does the relationship because we've put the wrong thing at the center. Does that make sense? Hear me, romance is great. Husbands, you better be wooing your wife all the days that you're together, okay? It's not just something you do before you get married. It's something you keep doing if you want to stay married, amen? And, and so romance is good. Emotions are good. God has given you emotions, okay? If somebody told you that you're too emotional, you know, just or you sh there's no place for emotion, they don't know what they're talking about. God gave you emotion. It's good to have emotion. It's good to have romantic feelings. Those things are good to have. But at the end of the day, the same feelings that got you there could be the feelings that end up blowing it up. And so if we make it all about feelings, then we're going to miss the point. It's not supposed to be centered around feelings. Can I tell you that a lot of times, though, in our, in our marriage, if you will, with Jesus, in our relationship with Jesus, we tend to put feelings at the center, don't we? Oh, it got quiet in here. That tells me I hit it. That's, that's where it's at. I hit the bullseye because I'm telling you there are people who we walk around, Christians, who put our feelings at the center. And so when I'm getting what I want, my faith is easy. When the, when the going gets a little bit difficult, when the road gets a little bit challenging, all of a sudden my faith you know, takes a nosedive. And then I'm down, well, I always say, I picked up these phrases in Indiana, okay? I'm not Southern, but I must say it anyway. We get down in the mully grubs, okay? And so that's just where we find ourselves. My wife's probably the only one, maybe why they're with me. They're like, yep, I know what that means. And so that's not what God's called us to. He's not called us to an emotionally centered faith where, where when we're feeling it in church and the music is just right and, and we're sort of, you know, lulled into this position, but then when we get out into the real life and all of a sudden there's screaming and fighting and feuding and bickering and politics and all of these other things, financial pressures, our faith takes a nosedive and we feel some other kind of way. That's, that's not what we're supposed to be about. And so there was this matchmaker, though, that I talked about. And so uh, this, this matchmaker, uh, you know, the Bible says that nobody comes to God except that the Holy Spirit draw them, right? The Holy Spirit is our matchmaker. The Holy Spirit draws us to God. He makes sure that there is a, a good match there. And so that's why not everybody comes to the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't have an opportunity. Everybody is called. Everybody has an opportunity to come to Jesus, but some people just, they're not ready to make that match. Listen, I, I've got some people who say to me, oh, if, if God would just do a big miracle in their life, then, then they would come to know God. If, if God would just speak to them in a way that they could just hear his voice, then they would come to, to know Jesus. They would enter into relationship with Jesus. And man, I wish it was that simple. I wish it was that easy. I wish there was a formula like that. But the reality is that I've seen too many times where somebody does get a miracle and still walks away and does not step into relationship with Jesus. I've seen where they hear the voice of God and it's, and it's unmistakably him and yet somehow their heart was not prepared to embrace that relationship, to engage in, in a marital commitment. Uh, I'm, I'm yours and you are mine forever and ever, Jesus. No, they, they, just, they just wanted to have basically a one night stand. They just, wanted, they just wanted to get what they wanted and get out of it. 
And Jesus is saying, I'm here for a commitment. I'm here for relationship. And sometimes people boil it down to a transactional thing. It's just all about what I can get out of it. And that's not what it's supposed to be about either. You see, sometimes people's big feelings for Jesus fizzle out. They're all in it first, but after a little while, they sort of start to lose interest. And so we need the Holy Spirit not just to draw us into salvation. We need the Holy Spirit to to help us to continue to live this Christian life, right? So, you know, his drawing to relationship with the Savior, it doesn't go away at salvation. If anything, it intensifies. If anything, that's where he really starts knocking on our door and saying, I want to spend time with you. I want to sit down with you. I want to share a meal with you. I want to meet face to face with you. I want you to hear my voice. I want to hear what's on your heart. He, he is beckoning you. He is drawing you all the time, not just before you knew Jesus, but even more so afterward. And, and, and it's up to us to respond and say, yes, I want what you have to offer. And so again, the, the first step to the ancient Jewish wedding is this shidukin. And so this time of mutual commitment, it came before the legal contract of betrothal. But it was here at this point in the process that the bride and groom would be separately cleansed, immersed in water, and uh, prepared for betrothal. So this was a, a preparation season. Likewise, Jesus was immersed in the waters of baptism in the Jordan River, and you and I are asked to be immersed, baptized in Christ. And so that, as I said, the next step is betrothal betrothal. And so this is a legally binding contract, and it involved the groom giving money or something of great value, maybe a ring to the bride, to seal their covenant vows. So the betrothal or engagement process would begin, typically lasting for about a year, and here's what the bride and groom did during that time. So the groom would go away, and he would prepare a place for his bride, probably build her a house. Uh, does that sound familiar? I'm, I'm going away. I'm preparing a place for you. Come on, if, if my father didn't have a, a mansion with many rooms, then I wouldn't tell you. you know, he, he's speaking of something that is both literal, but also it, it, is, it is prophetic. It is yet to come, right? So this parable is rooted in, in Judaic custom and ritual. They understand the traditions that he's speaking of. But it's also rooted in deep scriptural truth and and in future events that are yet to come. And so you have to understand that the audience that Jesus is speaking to where he's sharing this story, this would would hit them profoundly. This would impact them in such a way that they'd be like, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so we struggle to make these connections, and so it's important that we connect these dots And so the groom would go away to prepare a place. The bride would focus on her personal preparations with things like wedding garments, right? Like think radiant white. Think without spot or wrinkle, right? Again, apply these terms to our relationship with Jesus and what you know of the scriptures. That's the kind of bride he's coming back for, y'all. He's not coming back for some tore-up bride with some tore-up dress who didn't take any kind of care at all for making preparations. She wasn't mindful of the betrothal, this year-long process where she's supposed to be making preparations. As a believer, we better be making preparations, As a believer, we better be safeguarding our purity. As a believer, we better be safeguarding our relationship with Jesus because he is coming back. And we are in a a period of waiting. We are in a process of preparation. And so this is that legally binding contract. And so, you know, I, I love that I have a legally binding contract with my Jesus. We call it a covenant, right? And because of that covenant, we know that he keeps his promises. We know that his blood is still good to forgive and to heal and to cleanse and to restore and to deliver. And so he keeps his word. He makes good on every promise. And so we have a legally binding contract, and the devil knows it too. He knows I can't touch that man or woman of God. They're covered in the blood. He knows I, I can only go so far because the contract says I can't, I can't go any further. And the only time that he has any permission is when we give it to him. It's when we cross that line. It's when we step out from under the blood covering. And we go into places where we shouldn't. But when we stay where we're supposed to stay, when we do what we're supposed to do, when we accept the truth of who God says that we are, and we abide by the covenant that he has given us, then we got nothing to worry about. 
We got nothing to fear. Devil can't touch us. And so the groom would go, the bride would go, they'd make preparations. Another detail that the, the bride, like I said, would prepare was things like lamps. And so again, you can see how as he's talking about the, the lamps and the oil and all of these different aspects within the story, it would resonate with his audience. They'd know exactly what he's talking about. So uh, though the, the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she didn't know the exact day or hour he could come earlier if his father approved. And so for that reason, the bride kept oil lamps ready at all times, just in case the groom came in the night, sounding the shofar to lead the bridal procession to the home he had prepared for her. And likewise, we don't know the day or the hour. We don't know the precise time of Jesus' return, and so we're to live ready. We're to have lamps that are filled with oil. We're to understand that he might come in the midnight hour, and you'd be better, you better be ready then, not just on Sunday morning. You better be ready in the midnight hour. And so does this sort of make sense now? Step two is the step that Jesus is speaking of in the story. It's where we find ourselves today waiting for the bridegroom. And something we have to understand from that parable is this, that you can have potential, but it becomes pointless without preparation. I've seen too many people that I say, man, that one's gifted, that one's called, that one is marked, that one is is set apart, they are special, And they never take the time to develop what God has put inside of them. They refuse to do the menial tasks. They refuse to do the little things. They won't give God the little yes because they're holding out for the big things he's called them to do. Because he's called me to speak to 10,000, but they won't clean the toilet. You know what I mean? They, they, won't, they won't take out the trash. They, they, won't, they won't pray for the person across the aisle from them who needs a touch from God. But they're just holding out their big yes, but they're skipping the season of preparation. Now, the final step in Jewish wedding tradition is called nishuen, and it means to take, a word that comes from naso, which means to lift up. Let's look at John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, and it says this. This is what I referred to earlier. My, father, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And now let's jump over to Revelation chapter 22, and it says this, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. How many know that Jesus is a rewarder? Come on, he paid the price, and he's going to pay the price for you and for me. And so he, he paid the price at Calvary, amen, on the cross. He paid the ultimate price for your betrothal, hear me, and, and he is going to come to reward us on that great wedding day, and he ain't coming empty-handed. He's coming with a gift. He's coming with a reward. And he says, my reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. In other words, what we do in this life matters. It's not just, Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. And then that's it. Because if that was it, then poof, God would just zap you up out of here. No, he has called you for a purpose. You you are living in the time that you're living in, not by happenstance or coincidence. You have been given the gifts, the skills, the abilities that you've been given, the influence that you've been given, not by coincidence or on accident. God has positioned you because he has a purpose for your life. If there's still breath in your lungs, your mission is not complete. And so we need oil in our lamp, friends. You don't need oil in your lamp to be saved. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that we need oil in our lamp if we want to be ready for Jesus' return. Because one of two things can happen when you don't have oil in your lamp. Either you just don't, you don't fulfill the mission, the task that the Lord has set before you, and, and when he returns, you're going to be woefully disappointed in yourself. Because you could have done all of these things that he has, he has foreordained for you to do before the foundations of the earth. He had planned for you to do these good things that you neglected but because you didn't have the oil. The worst thing that can happen is when you don't have the oil, which, mind you, the oil in the Bible is always referencing the Holy Spirit and the anointing. And when you don't have the anointing and you don't have the Holy Spirit empowering you, can I tell you that the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit is impossible? 
And so when you don't have oil in your lamp, when you don't have the spirit empowering you, enabling you, you're not going to live righteously. You're, not, you're, you're going to abuse grace. You're going to take it for granted, and before long, you're walking in a completely different direction, and I've met far too many people who they say, I like Jesus, I'm not sure about this whole Holy Spirit thing, and because of their reluctance to receive the whole gospel, they, they took part of the gospel, and in the end, they found that it really wasn't enough. In the end, they found that it really didn't satisfy them, and it really didn't sustain them. And that was never God's plan, friends. God gives us the full gospel, which includes the Holy Ghost, because he wants to sustain us. He wants to supply us. He wants to strengthen us. And you can't have those things if you've got no oil in your lamp. And there's too many people, when their lamp runs dry, when their lamp goes empty, they walk away from God completely. And so there's great danger here if our lamp is not filled with oil. And so he's coming back. He's going to reward in verse 17 of Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I love that part right there. I don't know if you caught it. But the spirit and the bride say, come. So isn't it beautiful that we're invited? Come on, isn't it, isn't it wonderful that the Lord is beckoning us? When you go to him, you're not bothering him. You're not pestering him. You're not intruding on him. He says, I've given you a blanket invitation. You can come anytime. I invite you. I beckon you to come. But then right after that, it says, let the one who is thirsty come. I'm sorry. And let the one who hears say, what? Come. If you've heard the Lord say, come, Can I tell you, if you've truly heard his voice, if you've truly felt that tug on your heart of him drawing you in and he says, come, and you've entered into a true relationship with Jesus, then this scripture is true that let the one who hears now say, come. You're going to extend the invitation to others. You're not going to hoard it for yourself. You're not going to say this is just an exclusive relationship between me and Jesus. A, B, you see your way out of it. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, no, there's always room for more. And you're going to say, come, come. come." That's the essence of the gospel message. Can I tell you, you don't have to be some anointed preacher. You don't have to be some powerful evangelist. You don't have to have a giant platform. If you can simply start with one word, that's it, and it's come. Come. Come to church. Come to Jesus. Come to the Spirit of God. He's drawing you. Come. That's it. Anybody can do that. Anybody. And so, you know what that tells me? On the day that Jesus returns, we're all going to be without excuse if we don't simply do that. Everybody can say, come. Come. You're welcome. And so uh, we know the bridegroom is coming with his reward in hand. We know that he's prepared a place for us, and he's going to take us up to be with him. And the only question that remains is, will we be ready when he comes? Because, again, in our parable, there were five virgins, five or ten virgins, five who were wise and five who were not. We see that today still. We see many who are wise. We see many who are not wise and, and oftentimes what happens is we get them mixed up. The world will call Christians who are operating in the wisdom of God, they'll call us fools, right? And they'll call their foolishness wisdom. But in the kingdom, God sees it straight. He understands what true wisdom is and what true folly is. And on the day that Jesus returns, everybody who has rejected Jesus will be seen for the fool that they are. I mean, that's harsh, but it's true. And, and those that have chosen to receive Christ will be seen for the, the wise ones that they are because we have the wisdom of God. Now, now, get this. All of them were virgins, and all of them had lamps. So from the outside, they all looked the same. They all looked ready. They were all in the right place at the right time, and all of them even referred to the bridegroom in the same way. Lord, Lord. Are you, are you hearing me? How many times can we show up on a Sunday morning and and you and I have no ability to distinguish, right, between one and another, but the Lord looks down and he sees. 
He sees who's truly his. He sees who's truly consecrated to him, who's truly betrothed to him, who's really in relationship with him. And so we can play the church game, but it doesn't fool God. We can go through the motions, say the right words. We can wear the right clothes. I don't anymore. I decided I'm just going to be me. And I found out that Jesus says, come, come. And I love that. And so, but look at Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In other words, I don't care what you say. I want to see it backed up with your life. Do, Do you actually walk the talk? Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So again, this tells us that we can come to church, we can look the part, you can even serve in ministry and still not be a friend of the bridegroom. This should terrify us, that we could do all the right things and and have all the right appearances and and even wear, wear the badge and have the title and hold the microphone and still not be a friend of the bridegroom. It's dangerous, friends, but we can do church without the Holy Spirit. We can do church without oil in our lamps. And the sad reality is that many do, and many don't even notice. They aren't able to distinguish the five wise and the five foolish. Can I tell you that there is absolutely no wisdom in the eyes of man in doing the things of the Spirit? Man will look back and say, that's foolishness. Look at them jumping. Look at them dancing. Look at them. What are they? What are that? They look stupid. Like idiots. They probably check their brain at the door. You ever heard that one? Yeah. Check their brain. Those spirit filled, but they just check their brain at the door. They will look on that stuff and call it foolish and look on, you know, their reserved selves and, you know, and this is wisdom. Wisdom is to sit here and do nothing, right? They've got it backwards. They can't see that wisdom is saying, yes, Holy Spirit. Because I, my righteousness is as filthy rags. I do not have the power or the ability. If Jesus said to the disciples, I need you to go out and share the good news with the whole world, this is all on you guys, you 12, go out and radically revolutionize the world. Wait, 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 but not yet. Hold on. You need to wait until you are endued, until you are clothed with power from on high. Why? Because it was so important that they have the empowerment to carry out the task. They could not do that on their own. Are you kidding me? The things, the opposition they were up against, there's no way that they ever could have overcome that in their own power and in their own strength. And if they settled for the wisdom of man, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today. But they said, no, I want the wisdom of God. I want the Holy Spirit. I want oil in my lamp because it's not just about me, but it's about a far-off generation and a far-off place, people I will never meet this side of heaven, and that's what it's about. It's about the call of God and the fire that he has shut up in my bones to see this gospel go forth, and I cannot do it in my own power. And so that might not make me comfortable. I might not like it, but I'm going to say yes to God and open myself up to be a vessel that he can flow his oil through. You're a vessel, and he wants to put his oil inside of you that you would be a bright light that shines for Jesus. What are you going to shine if you don't have any fuel? You don't have any oil? What are you going to burn? You can't. You'll burn out. You'll burn out. I'm telling you that on the day of the Lord's return, there will be scores of false Christians exposed, many who will be turned away because they were not ready. They weren't ready. They weren't ready, just like these five virgins who were not ready. They might say, Lord, Lord, and they might hold up their resume. Oh, but look at all these things I did for you, Jesus. I'm sorry, that's not a backstage pass. You know, I don't know what you're waving that thing around for, but you can't come in. I don't know you. I don't know you. They didn't have oil in their lamps. See, Jesus isn't coming back for a worthless church full of empty lamps. He's returning for a bride with hearts set ablaze by the fire of the Spirit. 
You know, some people think they can go from matchmaker to matrimony, but they want to skip over betrothal, skip over that year-long preparation period. They want the ring without the requirements, the new house without a new heart. These are what I would call gold digger Christians. There's, there's too many gold digger Christians running around today. They're in it for what they can get out of it. It's not really a give and take kind of relationship. It's a take, take transactional kind of a thing. I'll take the forgiveness, I'll take the joy, I'll take the salvation, I'll take the peace, I'll take the acceptance, but I don't want to pay the price for oil. Hear me, grace is free. Forgiveness you don't have to pay for, but the oil is costly, friend. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you just like when you give your yes to the Holy Spirit, when you give your yes to the oil, you're going to have to give your no to a lot of things too. If you want to guard that oil, because I'm telling you, there's a bunch of fools who want to come around and snatch your oil. I don't have any. Can I have yours? And so if you're not careful, if you don't guard it, if you don't pay the price for it, if, if, if you just treat it like it's cheap and common and it's whatever, I'm talking about the anointing today. I'm talking about the anointing. The anointing, what is that? It's that supernatural empowerment. It's the super on your natural, right, to empower you, to give you the ability to do what you can't do, to say come and for it to actually work. It's one thing to say come, you know. It's another thing for somebody to say, you know, I feel something in here. When you said come, I felt something in here. I think I need to take you up on that offer. That's the difference between operating under the anointing or just doing it in your own strength, your own ability. The oil, the oil of the Spirit of God, it's going to cost us. The concept of the anointing and of oil isn't unique to the New Testament. We find its origins in the ancient text of Exodus, the 30th chapter. Let's take a look there. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Collect choice spices. 12 and a half pounds of pure myrrh, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant calamus, 24 and, sorry, tw- that's a verse number, 12 and a half pounds of cassia as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. Also get one gallon of olive oil. Like a skilled incense maker, blend these ingredients to make a holy anointing oil. Verse 26, use this sacred oil. Say sacred oil. Use this sacred oil to anoint the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and all its accessories, the incense altar, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the wash basin with its stand. Consecrate them to make them absolutely holy. After this, whatever, somebody say whatever, whatever touches them will also become holy. Whatever touches them will also become holy. Verse 30, anoint Aaron and his sons also, consecrating them to serve me as priests and say to the people of Israel, this holy anointing oil is reserved for me from generation to generation. If I was to be a part of a tribe of Israel, I'd want to be a part of the tribe of Asher because they were known for oil. And so when we're talking generation to generation, if there's a a legacy that you can hand down, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, I'm telling you there is nothing more precious than the oil. Nothing more precious. If you're going to leave an inheritance to your children and to their children, you better have some oil saved up for them. I'm telling you. You can put money in their piggy bank. You can, you can send them off to college, and you can, you can have them be the, you know, Mr. Iowa basketball player or whatever it is. Whatever it is. Those are all fine things. But at the end of the day, if you didn't give them any oil and their lamp is empty, the rest of that stuff's going to burn up. They better have oil. You better have oil if you want them to have oil. And so when the oil touches your life, whatever it touches becomes holy. Yeah, man, that's powerful. And scripture tells us that without holiness, why does holiness matter? Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Nobody. So let me ask you, what makes you think that you will get to see the Lord if you don't have oil in your lamp? We got to have holiness. And you can't have holiness without oil in your lamp. What makes you think the door won't be shut to you if you've shut the door to the spirit of holiness and don't welcome him in to touch and cleanse you? 
You need his touch. You need his cleansing. You need the oil in your lamp. You need to be refined. You need to be made more like Jesus. You need to be made holy. Jesus is returning for a bride dressed in radiant white, free of spot and wrinkle. You can't have that if you skip the betrothal of the Holy Spirit. You can't. You won't show up radiant white. You won't show up wrinkle-free, spotless. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can prepare you to be presented in that condition. Bottom line. So he's the one who draws you. He's the one who calls you. He's the one who reveals Christ to you. But he's also the one who purifies and sanctifies us and gets us ready for the wedding. And if we try to do things our own way, Jesus warns you'll end up on the wrong side of that door holding an empty lamp, a stranger to him. Let's go back to the beginning. Who's he talking to? Believers. 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 Because we can look at this and we can say, yeah, you unbelievers, you better be careful. You might find yourself on the other side of that door. And Jesus can say, I don't know you. He's not talking to them. I don't know how many times we have to say that to our kids, right? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you, right? (laughs) How many times must the father have to say that? Hello, I'm not talking. I'm talking about you. And right here, he's talking about you. Not you, Jew. He's talking about you. And so he's talking about me. He's talking about us. He's talking about believers. And we run the risk. This is Jesus talking. Okay? This isn't Paul. This isn't Peter. This isn't John. This isn't James. This is Jesus. And I don't know anybody who's going to refute what Jesus says. And he makes it really clear. Believers who he is addressing, you run the risk of being on the wrong side of that door if you have no oil in your lamp. We better pay attention to what he's talking about here. So make no mistake, when Christ returns, he will separate the wheat from the chaff, the ones who truly loved him, from the ones who merely love themselves. And when you truly love him, you'll love the oil. You know, my wife could buy me a lot of different things. My kids, they could buy me a lot of different things. But honestly, at the end of the day, nothing would mean more to me than a heartfelt sentiment, right? Right? I mean, you're probably the same way. Your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, you know, they could buy you something fancy, but really what you want is something from their heart. And, and you're never going to dislike what they give you when it comes from their heart. And the same should be true that if you love Jesus, you should love the gifts that he gives you, and we should love the oil. We shouldn't just tolerate the oil. We shouldn't just theologically agree with the oil. We should love the oil. I need the oil. I love that oil. I love every gift that my Jesus gives to me. And when you truly love others, you'll love the oil. It's how we'll fulfill the law and the prophets. It's how we fulfill the great command of Jesus, found in the very same chapter, by the way, as this parable we're talking about, the command, the great command of Jesus, same chapter as the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. And and, and the foolish here, they thought that they could, you know, snag some last second oil from the wise people, right? They thought, well, I'll just, I'll just hold out. You've obviously got enough to cover all of us. And see, here's what I want to share with you, that foolish people think that wise people are their provision. I don't need oil. I got you. I don't need to have a, a thriving, on-fire relationship with God. That's my wife's job. She'll, she'll make sure the kids got oil. I, don't, I can go watch football. I can go fishing. I can go hunting. I can go do this and that. She'll take care of it. No, 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 no. You need to have an on-fire relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't think that, that wise people are your provision. If you've got no oil in your lamp, you have no provision. There is no provision, not for you, not for your children, not for anybody. And, and you and I, again, we are called to a very specific task. You are gifted for a very specific purpose. And if you don't have oil in your lamp, nobody else's oil is going to do you any good. Bottom line. And so we can't, you know, the Pharisees, by the way, that's how they got into this whole thing. You know, we need, we need some good scholarly religious people to lead us, right? And, and people gave their trust to these people who turned out to be hypocrites, turned out to be the number one enemy of Jesus, the number one group that he was rebuking over and over and over again. They're the ones who irked him to the point that he's flipping tables and cracking whips, right? 
Okay, and these are the ones, but because the foolish people said we need some wise people to be our provision, they settled for less than the provider. They settled for less than oil. They walked around with empty lamps and said, the priest will take care of that for us. Can I tell you that I'm not your provision? Your Sunday school teacher isn't your provision. Your, your kids, you know, children's minister is not their provision. We need to have the provision of the Holy Spirit, not just for adults, y'all. The kids need the oil too. There's no junior Holy Spirit. They need the Spirit of God every bit as much as you and I need the Spirit of God. So we need to understand that an oilless church is in trouble. An oilless church is in trouble. A church without the oil of the Spirit is an empty lamp without holiness. And they won't see the Lord. It's not just an individual thing, but it can be a corporate thing too. As a church body, we, you can have smoke and lights, you can have a jumbo LED screen, but at the end of the day, none of that stuff's going to bring breakthrough. It's not. None of that stuff's going to bring deliverance. None of it will bring healing. The church in America is full of fanciful gadgets today, but has no oil. This is a rarity. I understand that. To have, to have a preacher in a pulpit today in 2022 preaching on the oil of the Holy Spirit that we need this is a rarity, let alone somebody under the age of 50 preaching on the oil of the Spirit. It's a rarity. More and more, it's becoming a rarity. But I believe that we need it. I believe that the, 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 the lights and the smoke, and I'm not saying those things are bad, hear me. But they're not going to bring deliverance. They're not going to bring breakthrough like the oil of the anointing. Relevance to a blind man isn't how cool is your light show. Relevance to a blind man is, do you know a man that can make me see? Relevance to a broken family is not how cool is your church. Relevance to a broken family is, can you take me to a man who can heal our wounds? We need that kind of an anointing. We need that kind of oil flowing. And I'm telling you, there's a, there's a, a thought today, even in the church of Jesus Christ, that says that the oil is not relevant. Can I tell you, there's nothing more relevant than the oil. There's nothing more relevant than the anointing. There's nothing more relevant than the Holy Spirit because it's the oil that makes the difference. It's the oil that makes the difference. It's the anointing of the Spirit on our lives. It's God's presence on our being that empowers us to do what he's called us to do in a way that brings life and hope to people in the darkest places. In the darkest places. And I don't ever want to live without the oil of God in my vessel. Never. Because Jesus doesn't want us just to have oil for Sunday mornings at church. Jesus wants us to have oil burning inside of us, that, that burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God that we need to proclaim freedom to those who are in bondage and under oppression by the enemy. Look, anybody can have enough oil for a sunny Sunday afternoon, but the question is, does your lamp burn bright in the midnight hour on Friday? Does your lamp burn bright in the midnight hour on Friday? Your life is meant to show people what Jesus is like. You know that, right? And he came into the darkest places to the most hopeless and broken of situations. Your oil is meant for that. Your oil is meant to light a lamp that goes into the darkness, that goes into the hopeless and into the broken situations, that they would say, oh, that's Jesus. I thought Jesus was just for Sunday mornings. I've never met a Christian who actually would step into my mess. I've never met a Christian who would actually step into the darkness. I've never met a Christian who would step into a conversation that is laced with profanity and all kinds of filth while I'm, you know, drunk out of my mind. Jesus would do that. Jesus would engage with, with a drunken person who is incoherent and screaming and cussing, and he would do it with love. Because, hear me, he was anointed. He had the spirit to overflowing. To the fullness of the spirit was demonstrated in Christ. That means his lamp was always full. No matter how much he poured out, his lamp was always full. And so if we're going to be Jesus to the world, if we're going to really let them see that the oil isn't just for Sunday mornings, but it's for the midnight hour on Fridays, it's for the people who are broken and hopeless, that we've got to make sure that our lamp is full. 
we got to make sure that we live under the anointing if we want to see those burdens removed and those yokes destroyed. If we want to see people get free, we don't, you have power to free people without the oil? Thank you. Yeah, without the Holy Spirit? No. In our own selves, we don't have the ability. And hear me, I want to make this really simple because I think Jesus is all about making things simple. At the end of the day, when he returns, when the bridegroom comes back, he wants to see, did we really love people, right? And if we love people, we'll have oil in our lamp. And if we were content to live a life that didn't have oil in our lamps, it will actually prove the opposite, that we really didn't love people. We could say we did. We could have tried some things in our own strength, but the Lord says very clearly, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And if I don't have oil in my lamp, I'm not going to be able to get the job done. I don't have love in my heart, neither for Jesus nor for people, if I don't care to have oil in my lamp when Jesus says, I'm coming back and this is what matters. This is what you need to be sure of. Jesus was always healing, always delivering, always giving hope, always full of oil, always burning bright. So Jesus was anointed. The word anoint simply means to to rub into or to smear upon. And so Jesus was smeared with the anointing. Specifically, he was anointed with the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. And the gospel really isn't complete without this peace. Because remember, Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God here on the earth. He called us to follow his example of doing what? Bringing heaven down. Bringing heavenly realities down into earthly situations. Bringing the kingdom to bear in in difficult situations. Bringing Bringing the same healing, the same deliverance, that same salvation that's only possible by the power of God. This gospel message wouldn't be good news if Jesus called us to do something that that he didn't empower us to carry out. If the good news ended at, Jesus did this for you, end of story, then okay, fine. But it doesn't end there. Because, Because the book of Acts is a continuation of the gospel. And if you read the book of Acts, you see what the disciples did. You see, you know, Peter walking down the street and his shadow is healing people. You see that they're going out into all the world and proclaiming the gospel, the good news of Christ, even at the threat of martyrdom and ultimately mostly giving their lives for the cause of Christ. You see that they were, they were taking this anointing with them. You see that, that it wasn't just what was done for them, but that oil was, was something that they're now supposed to steward and carry and use for the glory of God. And so it wouldn't be good news if Jesus called you and me to go out and perform those tasks, to, to do even greater miracles, he would say, than what he did, but he didn't equip us, he didn't give us the empowerment to be able to do those things. It's like a teacher, you probably have one of these teachers, where they they give you a test on stuff they never taught you, right? Like, this was not on the pretest, right? And and Jesus is not going to do that to us, friends. And so he's, he's preparing us right here. He's given us the answers. He says, I'm coming back. There will be a test, a final judgment, and I'm going to give you the answers right now. Just have oil in your lamp. Have oil in your lamp, and you'll pass. So we can't reject this aspect of the gospel message. We can't begin to try and do church and do life without the empowerment of the Spirit. It's simply not possible. We need the oil. Come on, I said, we need the oil. Are you awake this morning? We need the oil. You know, as I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but think, think back to the Tin Man in Wizard of Oz, if you've seen that movie, right? It's a classic. And, you know, he gets all rusted up, and it got to get his joints moving again. You got to get all the different body parts moving again, you know, get his mouth talking again. And, and, and the key to that, of course, was that, you know, Dorothy needed to come over and squirt some oil into the, those different joints and those different parts to get the whole body moving. Can I tell you that in these last days that the church of Jesus Christ is no longer going to be effective because you have an anointed worship leader or an anointed preacher. I'm telling you that the last day's revival and the greatest effectiveness that the church of Jesus Christ will ever see, ever, take all the revivals in history, add them up, and it will not 
It will not equate to the revival that we're going to see. But here, listen to me, it is not going to come because of the anointing that simply rests on a preacher or on a worship team. It's going to come because the whole body got oil. Because the whole body, because the fingers could finally work, because the wrist and the knees and the feet and the neck could finally work, and all of a sudden, the full body is mobilized, and it's able to move and to flex against the powers of darkness. I'm telling you, we need the oil. The whole body needs to be activated. You need the oil. We need that burden-destroying, yoke-removing power of God. So Jesus, he's not going to settle for an oilless church, and we shouldn't either. It's what fueled the New Testament church. Let's look at Acts 10 and verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So again, this is our perfect picture, our model of the anointed one, who again, he emptied himself of his divinity, and he allowed himself to be a vessel filled up with the oil of the Holy Spirit, So the same way that he did it is the same way that we do it. And I love the power of those five little words. I don't know if you caught it. It was at the end of verse 38, those five little words, because God was with him. Because God was with him, there was healing. Because God was with him, there was deliverance. Because God was with him, there was freedom. And then just a few verses later, in verse 44, we read this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And now pay pay close attention here because I really want you to get this. The anointing that was on Jesus came upon Peter. The oil that was on Jesus' life was now on Peter's life. And as Peter allowed himself to be used as a vessel for the Lord, the oil began to spill out. The anointing got poured out onto the Gentiles. The anointing got poured out onto the unbelievers. The oil began to spill out on the heathens on the pagans, on the sinners. You know some sinners in your life? You know some sinners that could use a little bit of that oil? The good news is that it wasn't just Jesus, the anointed one. It wasn't just Peter, the anointed one, and the apostles, and those that we want to put up on a pedestal. He says, you're my anointed ones. And he says, I don't just want that anointing and that oil to touch your life. I want it to touch their life too. Whoever, they're, whoever they is, who's that person in your life that you're believing for? I want them to come to know Jesus. They need a touch of God. I'm telling you that if you will fill your lamp with oil, they stand a chance. If you don't fill up your lamp with oil, I can't promise you this, but I wanna at least ask the question. If you don't fill up your, oil, your lamp with oil, what if? they don't stand a chance. What if? What if? What if the Lord has positioned you for that task? And when he comes back, they will be on the other side of that door. You might be on the right side, but they might be on the wrong side. And it might be just a suggestion. It might be, at least in part, because you didn't bother to fill your lamp with oil. You loved them. You tried in your own power and in your own strength. But God said, if you would have just let me oil that thing, it would have run a whole lot better. If if you would have just let me fill that lamp up, it would have shined a whole lot brighter. And in their darkest hour, that light would have been bright enough to draw them in. Again, I don't know that to be true, but I don't want to play around with fire. I don't want to take the risk of not having oil, not just for myself, but as a Western Christian believer, I believe 
that it's time that we push back consumerism, push back against the idea that it's all about my personal relationship with Jesus. Hear me, that's important, but it's not all about. Those people matter. The people who haven't heard, they matter. The people who are going through a rough patch, they matter. The people who find themselves in the places now that Jesus found us back then, they matter. They matter. They matter. And so I I say, I place a value on what matters. I place a value on Jesus who matters the most. I place a value on the lost people who desperately need to know him. And because I place a value on those two things, I say that I place a value on the oil. I place a value on the oil because if I love Jesus and I love people, then I have to love the oil. Remember from Exodus, whatever, whatever the sacred oil touches becomes holy. And because God was with them, he put the super on their natural. I wonder if you would humble yourself today to the point where you'd say, I I need that. I need that empowerment. I need him to come alongside me. I need his oil to be upon my life to assist me to do what I know that I can't do on my own. But hear me again, friend, I'm not here to sell you cheap oil. The oil that we're talking about was comprised of five ingredients. Three or four of them at least were were fragrant and they were costly. One of them only grew at elevations of over 8,000 feet. You'd have to make quite the hike, quite the trip to go and get this particular ingredient. But God was specific about how the anointing oil was to be made and that there was a price that was involved, that it was costly. I'm not here to sell you cheap oil. I'm here to be honest with you and to tell you that it will cost you. There will be a price involved. And if you give him your yes to fill your lamp with oil, then you better be prepared to give your no to some other things. Because if you're like me, you don't got money for everything in the world, right? If I'm gonna buy this, then I can't buy that. And it works the same way in the kingdom. If I'm gonna prioritize this, then I gotta quit prioritizing that. Some people wanna have their cake and eat it too, but God's gonna push you out of your comfort zone. When you buy oil, and you say, okay, you want all in on that oil, then you're gonna have to, gonna have to give your no over there. You're gonna to have to quit being about this. You're gonna to have to shift your priority from over there to over here now. And so there's gonna be a requirement that comes along with that. So I'm going to ask you if you would just to stand to your feet as we get ready to close. Just like we read in that text earlier that God was with them. How many know that God is with us here today? And that means that there's fresh oil available. He doesn't want you using yesterday's oil, friend. Yesterday's oil was for yesterday's fire. That stuff's burned up. It's junk. It's to be disposed of. It's no longer any good. He, you need fresh oil. You need fresh oil. We need, uh, some people today need some fresh mercies. You need some fresh healing. You need fresh deliverance. You need some fresh peace. You need a fresh joy to nourish your soul. I don't know what you need today, but God has a fresh supply of it. Would you just bow your head and close your eyes? I believe the Holy Spirit wants to give you oil and it's gonna meet every need far beyond what you could ever ask, think, or imagine. If you need healing, the oil is enough. If you need, if you need salvation in your family and you need to, to make sure that, that they hear the gospel the right way and that they get a touch from the Holy Ghost, the oil is going to be enough for you to be able to do that. You need a healing. You need joy. The oil is going to be enough for you. The Holy Spirit has an endless supply. And here's what I want you to really hear as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, because I believe that there are some people in here who have some jacked up theology that I wanna straighten out real quick. And that jacked up theology is that I can only have oil in my lamp if I deserve it. And what I'm here today to tell you real simply is this, the only prerequisite for oil in your vessel is that you be emptied. That's it. If you are empty today, then I'm telling you, you're the perfect candidate 
for the oil to be poured into you, to be emptied. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you think that you're already filled up with something else, you've got some work to do. You've got to empty yourself for him to fill you with his oil. Again, that oil is a fragrant aroma. That oil puts off like an incense up to heaven. It puts off an aroma of worship from your life that is glorifying, that is pleasing, that will draw others in. It's attractive. The team's going to lead us in a song. I'm going to come back. We're going to pray. And I have a very specific word and a call for this altar. But I want all of us to just spend some time in worship letting the Lord fill us up, fill us with his oil, that we might be a living sacrifice to him. That the aroma that our life puts off, not just on a Sunday morning, but Friday night, the midnight hour, in the darkest places, in the darkest seasons, that our life would declare that he is worthy. He is worthy. Lord, I'm going to fill myself with oil because you're worthy. God, I'm going to go to that neighbor and tell them about Jesus because you're worthy. I'm going to go and forgive that person that I've been holding a grudge against because, God, you're worthy. You're worthy of it all, and I'm ready to lay it all down. And so this altar is, of course, always open. We're going to worship for the next few moments. Would you just declare how worthy he is? Would you, would you let your life become a fragrant aroma? that rises up to heaven. And as you lift him up, as you empty yourself of you, would you become that container, that vessel, that you say, God, would you fill me? Fill me with the oil of your Holy Spirit. Let's do that now for the next few moments. I'll come back together here and we'll we'll pray as we close.
both in the spirit and in the natural. I see that there are parts of the body of Christ that are being that are being anointed right now, that are being activated right now, that the oil is being loosed upon those areas right now that you're you've been sidelined, you've been you you've had you've had spiritual arthritis. You haven't been able to move those ligaments and those joints. And the Lord is loosening and lubricating up right now those areas spiritually so that you can be activated and once again flowing in the gift that God has given you. And he's even releasing new gifts in this place. He's activating people in ways that you've never been activated before simply because you've said, yes, I want the oil. But I believe even in the natural, the Lord is touching and he is anointing and he is releasing a healing oil upon people's lives right now, touching knees and touching backs and touching different areas of the body in the physical realm to bring healing. I believe that God's done a great work here and I believe he's continuing to move, but there's a very specific group of people that I wanna speak to and it's the people who feel like you've been going through a, a pressing season, a crushing season. You've been, you've been enduring a hardship where you feel hard pressed on every side, where you feel like there's just a weight that has been upon your life and, and it's like it's just been caving in on you and, and, and you'd love to escape this season. You'd love to find some kind of rescue out of this season, but I really believe that the Lord wants you to know that the pressing isn't without a purpose. He wants you to know today that the crushing, it's not meant to cripple you, it's meant to call you. That it's in this season that you're gonna be not just pressed, but pushed into your prayer closet. Pushed into the place of intimacy with the bridegroom pushed into the place where you can really hear his voice and experience his touch. Pushed to the point where you finally say, yes, I'll buy oil. I'm 
telling you today, friends, the crushing isn't meant to cripple you. It's, it's meant to call you. It's meant to set you apart for his purposes. The crushing is what's going to draw you in. The pressing is what's going to draw you in. That the oil is going to be pressed out of your life. That it's not just going to be stockpiled and stored up for some rainy day. I'm telling you today, friends, there's some of y'all that got more toilet paper in your house than you got oil in your lamp. And God is saying, today is the day that all of that changes. Today is the day that your lamp is going to be filled up in the same way that Jesus's was, not so that it could be stored up, stashed away, or saved for some rainy day, but you're going to be able to pour out and it will be poured back into you. You're going to be able to pour out and it will be poured back into you. And why is that? Because day and night, night and day, you're going to let incense arise. You're going to exalt the Lord. And as you lift him up, I'm telling you that there is, a, there is an oil of heaven that will drip down upon your life and it will refill your lamp. I'm hearing that from the Lord so very clearly. And if that's you, if you haven't already responded to this altar, I wanna, I wanna ask you, I know that if you're in a dry season, I know that if you're in a place where you say it just, I feel so empty, it can be hard to move out into this altar. But I'm telling you, this call is for you. This call is for the empty one. This call is for the dry one. This one is for the, the one who feels pressed and crushed, but God says there is a purpose and I'm going to release fresh oil. I was asked last night, I was here doing some work, and uh, somebody else was here doing some work, and they came to my door, my office, and they put their hand up on the door frame. I said, what is that? What, what, is, what, what is that? I so I kind of laughed. I go, that's probably oil. <laughs> I said, there's somebody who likes to anoint all the door frames in the place. And I, I said, hey, praise God, you know, like, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, it might leave a sticky substance. But I believe that what we experience in this room, hear me, I believe what we experience in this room has much to do with that oil and that sticky substance. Listen, there's nothing special about this. Not, not on the surface. But it is a representation of us saying, Holy Spirit, we need you. This is oil. And we're saying, as I apply it, I'm inviting you, Holy Spirit, to come into my situation, to come into my life, to fill my lamp. And so I'm going to ask the uh, oil anointing extraordinaire who makes all of our door jams sticky. If, if uh, Ron Dehart, would you come and uh, you just know how to use this stuff, Mr. Dehart. You have to tap him. And uh, would you come and would you place a dab on the forehead of every person in this altar? As we continue to worship, I just I just feel led by the Holy Spirit to do this. Here's here it's right here, it's right here. So if you want to be anointed, if you want the oil of God, we're going to anoint right now. We're just it's simply what the Bible says. If you're sick today, the Bible says to anoint the sick with oil, to pray the prayer of faith, and they will be made well. We're simply following Scripture. Call me crazy, but I believe that the Word of God is still true. And so we're going to go ahead, we're going to do that. We're going to anoint right now. We're going to let the Holy Spirit do what only he can do. And so we're not going to push you. We're not going to do anything crazy. Here's what we're going to do. We're simply, Ron is simply going to come. He's just going to dab you. Dab, dab, dab. And the Holy Spirit's going to do the rest. Your job is just to worship. Your job is just to open yourself up as a vessel for the Holy Spirit to pour oil into. And so if you need healing, let's believe that God can do that right now. If we need, if we need the refreshing of, of the joy of the Lord to touch us, let's believe that the Lord can do that right now. If you need the anointing for the task that is set before you, let's believe that God can anoint you for that task right now. And so I want to pray, and as Ron moves through the group, let's just continue to worship as the team worships behind me. Father, we thank you that today there's oil in the house. God, we know that there can't be fire if there isn't oil, if there isn't fuel. But God, we want to be a living sacrifice. And so as we respond at this altar, God, we want to be a living sacrifice that, God, we lay ourselves down. And God, that you would fill us with your oil. 
God, that we would be burning ones, that we would burn brightly for your namesake, that when we say that we exalt you, that we do it more than with just our words, but with our lives. So Lord, let us be filled with the oil of the Spirit. Let us be ignited. God, set ablaze for your glory. God, that you would be exalted in all the earth. God, not just on Sunday morning, but on Friday night in the midnight hour. God, that we would be sent ones, that we would be ambassadors sent out to shine as bright lights on the backdrop of a dark world. God, in the midst of, of dark and troubling times, use us, Lord God, to be a beacon of hope. God, we're not here to curse the darkness, but God, we want to be the ones that you set ablaze that would point people to Jesus. So Lord, we ask that you would do that. God, for those that are in need of a healing touch, God, as, as Ron touches them with that oil, God, I pray the Holy Spirit would course through their veins like only you can, oh God, touching them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. For those that are in need of the oil of gladness to just fill their hearts with joy, God, in the midst of a difficult season, God, I pray that you would just fill them to overflowing with a joy unspeakable, a joy that doesn't even make sense, a joy that bubbles out of them with laughter, God. They can't even put it into words, but God, they'll just laugh in your presence. God, I thank you, Lord, for the anointing that's coming upon people's lives. God, for the way that you're activating them into the gifts and the callings of the Holy Spirit for them. God, I thank you, Lord, for that fresh anointing and lubrication of the oil of the Spirit. God, for those that are feeling crushed and pressed in this season, God, I pray that they would lay themselves down and say, Lord, I'm not going to let this season be wasted. I'm not going to turn my back on this season, Lord God, that you want to bring good out of the enemy might have orchestrated it for my harm but God you're gonna use the pressing you're gonna use the crushing and out of it will flow oil release your oil oh God release your oil oh God in our lives right now in Jesus name